the VFR 750 was a legendary, super capable all-rounder, which has now become this here VFR 800, which is a faster, more comfortable, better equipped version of the original bike. My heart sank when I found out we were testing sports tourers for this week's show, because no sports tourers test is complete without one of these, Honda's Evergreen VFR. And sadly, very few sports tourers tests are also complete without said VFR naffing off into the sunset with the top honours. In eight years as a bike journalist, I have lost count of the number of sports tourers tests I've done. And I've also lost count of the number of times the VFR has been the winner. It's just so predictable. I've ummed, I've ahed, I've lain awake at night desperately trying to find reasons for something else, anything else, to wrest the VFR's crown from its iron grasp. But whatever I do, it never works out. First up, the VTEC in that motor. It may give you two valves per cylinder low down for better torque, and it may give you four valves per cylinder higher up for better performance. It may also give the bike a power band that makes it feel faster than the previous model. But VTEC is old technology that Honda have pilfered from their car range, and there's still only 107 horsepower in there. The motor may only have 107 horsepower, but it's plenty fast enough on the road. The chassis makes this the sharpest VFR yet, and the same is true of the brakes, which bite beautifully when asked. It's easily all day comfortable, one or two up. There's a clock, naturally. The mirrors are excellent. The headlight turns night into day, and there's even a centre stand. Short of the fact that this motorcycle doesn't actually ride itself, it is still one of the best bikes ever made and it's probably the winner here. There you go, I said it, again. Styling, seven out of 10, best looking VFR ever. Performance, eight out of 10, doesn't excel anywhere, but is good everywhere. Practicality, nine out of 10, it's well made, it's built to last, and as well as that, it'll handle just about anything you want to do. Value, eight out of 10, just a shade under eight grand, it's not a cheap motorcycle, but you do get a lot of bike for your money. Yamaha are the first of the big Japanese manufacturers to leap into the supermoto fray by tarting up their old Enduro XT660 and bringing it kicking and screaming into the modern day to make this supermoto style XT660X. Where supermotos like KTM's LC4 represent the lunatic fringe of the market, Yamaha's XT660X is Captain Sensible. Sure, it looks the part with its chunky, funky bodywork, aggressive pointy beak and upswept tail, but underneath it all, this bike is an XT660, Yamaha's venerable bulletproof trailer that's been around since Noah was a lad. If you want a stylish, fun plaything that will give you minimum grief, but still has the capacity to raise the odd smile, then step this way. Because beneath all the XTX's bad boy styling lies a very handy motorcycle. It's actually comfortable enough to ride around on all day and can even handle the odd motorway stretch every now and again. It's also as tough as a hammer and as simple as Forrest Gump, so don't expect any reliability hassles. That single cylinder motor does vibrate, but not enough to send you to the dentist for new fillings, as some of the other bikes here might, and it'll happily punt you up to 90 mile an hour in pretty short order. The handling is soft and the bike is heavy compared to the competition here, but there's still enough control to the whole plot to let you chuck it all about with plenty of fun. You'll probably be faster on one of the Huskies, but you'll be having just as much fun on the Yamaha which is where it scores big points. It may be the friendly Labrador of this pack, but it still looks like a Rottweiler. Styling, seven out of 10. Looks the part, I reckon. Performance, six out of 10. Probably the most capable all-rounder here, 
but not always the most exciting. Practicality, eight out of 10. You could live with this every day and you know it'll start every morning too. Value, seven out of 10. It's the cheapest bike here. Time to get to grips with the Fireblade and in case you hadn't guessed that makes me very, very happy indeed because the Fireblade is one of my favourite motorcycles of all time ever. Why? Well, where to begin? It's so tricky isolating one point of this bike that is so good because not only are they all good but it's the way they hang together as a whole that makes the Fireblade experience so special. Anyway, I'll take a deep breath, calm down a little bit now and let's get to work. The defining part of the Fireblade experience for me is that front end. The way you sit plugged into it more directly than a teenager into a Game Boy. The way your weight is in exactly the right place for total control. The way the whole bike can be slammed from upright to knee slider in ooh, a nanosecond and in total confidence. All these things make the Fireblade special because big sports bikes shouldn't be this responsive. Staying with that front end, the brakes are absolutely legendary. Class leading, eyeball popping, stoppy throwing, brilliant they are. Best production bike brakes out yet, or at least they were, until the ZX6 came out. But we'll come to that later. And then there's the engine. Now in the past, recent incarnations of the blade have been accused by some people of being a little soft, a little tame, even, crikey, a little bit slow. Now personally, I'd never call a 170 mile an hour motorcycle slow, but there was a grain of truth in the criticism. The blade, once the baddest boy on the block, had become a little tame. But not anymore. Now up to 954 cc from the original 899, and with peachy clean fuel injection, the blade is now badass and as fast as you like. 177 mile an hour is the most we ever got out of one speed testing, and although a GSX R1000 will hit nearly 10 mile an hour more, outright top speeds aren't quite the whole story. The deal with the blade is because its power kick is that little less brutal than something like a GSX R1000s, then you can use more of the power more at the time. Then there are the wheels. Oh boy. Obviously, these are not big, nor are they clever, but they are fun. Pop the blade up in first with a sniffer clutch, snick into second and head into the sunset, grinning like the village idiot. The build quality is outstanding and as a very serious sports bike you can still live with day after day. Personally, I use mine for 15,000 miles of everything from commuting to touring to track days. The blade is unbeaten. And so to the downsides, because yes, there are some. First of all, the looks. Now there is no doubt that Honda have made this bike the best looking blade we've seen in years, but still it doesn't have the same badass street cred that those first 1992 twin headlight models did. And the final bugbear on the Fireblade makeup is insurance. Fireblades have been thrashed, trashed and stolen for years now and don't the insurance companies know it. So much so that this is one of the hardest bikes to insure in the country. Other than that, the Fireblade is an absolute belting motorcycle and truly an example of all that is wonderful in modern motorcycling today. And after all that excitement, I'm going to need a lie down. But first of all, here's the scores. Performance, 10 out of 10. Yes, yes and yes. Styling, 6 out of 10. Close, but no cigar. Covers up what really is a mad, mad motorcycle. Street cred, 8 out of 10. It's got presence and it's still got that Fireblade name on the side. Reliability, 8 out of 10. These bikes really are built to last. But that gearbox perhaps isn't if you're not lucky. Value for money, 9 out of 10. This bike will make you laugh, giggle, and possibly occasionally cry with excitement. Just make sure you can afford the insurance. In their own way, Super Tourers are just as single-minded as big superbikes. They can tour supremely, but the rest of the riding equation, like getting through town, commuting, getting a wiggle on down the back roads on a sunny Sunday, all gets a bit lost in the mix. Scale down a bit from the real big boys though, and suddenly you find bikes that can still breeze you across continents, but they'll also handle pretty much anything else you fancy as well. As old as the Ark and with almost as much luggage space, Honda's Pan-European has been about in various guises since pretty much the dawn of time. And this is the latest and most refined version here. Jolly good it is too. Plonk yourself into the sumptuous seat, fiddle with the electrically adjustable screen, choosing between peaceful isolation from any wind blast at all, that'll be screen right up then, 
or good old fashioned wind in your hair, flies in your teeth mode. Scream right down for anyone who's confused. And then get yourself ready for some serious miles. Like the Goldwing, the Pans motor is more than adequate for the job and punts the old Golf forward on a creamy wave of V4 torque in very short order indeed. Like the wing again though, the gearbox isn't the greatest, but it's still up to the job and less prone to dropping out of gear than its larger counterparts. Handling is very nimble for a bike so large, and you can happily bob and weave through rush hour melee just as easily as you can attack a Nadri Alpine switchback after a lengthy payage stretch. Should you really fancy surprising anyone at the roadside, this bike will also wheelie with the best of them. It does help if you put some weight in the panniers though. But no bike on bike file is safe from being rated and scored. So it's off to the scoreboards for the Pan European. Performance, seven out of 10. Very capable handling, decent brakes, and a lovely smooth motor. But gotta knock a few points off that weirdo weave that pokes its head in above 100 mile an hour. Styling, five out of 10. Sorry, but it's not pretty whichever way you look at it. Comfort, nine out of 10. It's there by the absolute bucket load. Reliability, eight out of 10. Something might go wrong with one of these, but it's pretty unlikely. Value for money, eight out of 10. For a bike that's as capable as this, it's an absolute bargain. And now it's time for us to meet our first motorcycle of the day on this rather chilly, incredibly bright morning. Now you've got to feel sorry for Ducati. There they were with an awesome performing modern classic in the shape of their 998, yet they knew eventually something would have to change. Change. There's something us human beings fear the most. So you just knew that when the object being changed was as close to our hearts and daydreaming minds as the old Ducati 998, that when the replacement came out, there would be an almighty wailing and gnashing of teeth. And there was, because here it is, the replacement of the Ducati 999. Let's get the formalities out of the way first. This bike ain't anywhere near as purdy as the 916, 996, 998 family, and nor is it likely to achieve their timeless majesty either. But who cares? We could argue semantics on styling all day long, but personally, I'd rather get on with riding the bikes rather than jawing about them. Climb aboard the 999 and you know straight away that this is a completely different animal to its predecessor. It is longer, it is slightly lower and it is altogether a damn sight more comfortable. Yes, the 998's famous torture rack riding position that both Ducati and osteopaths around the world have been making fortunes out of for years now is at last gone. This definitely is a Ducati you can actually spend time on away from the racetrack without needing a hot bath and a brace of masseurs to look after you upon your return. But up the ante and you'll still find that despite the new and improved bonus comfort, you're still in just the right position on board for Banzai track attack when necessary. The 999 retains the mind-bending mid-corner poise of its predecessors. No other production sports bike feels as safe at silly lean angles as one of these. The best thing about the 999's handling though is although the mid-corner abilities are still impeccable, where every incarnation of the predecessor from the 916 onwards needed a serious amount of body weight to actually get it turned in the first place, the 999 now flicks in with the lightest of nudges on the inside bar and then proceeds to happily hug the kerb all the way to the spot on apex of your choice. Precision and sweet steering, whatever next. The gearbox is prone to the odd false neutral here and there when you're tramping on at the track. On the road, it's not so much of a problem, but if you are onto thrashing your mates on a track day, Make sure you use a firm left boot to avoid any embarrassing misgears. If we were poking around for another downside to this bike, it would be the question of noise. Or rather, the lack of it. This bike is quite simply far too quiet for a great big red V-twin. To be honest, the sound is more of an apology than a boom that comes out of that exhaust. Otherwise, the 999 is absolutely bang on. And as for the looks, get over it, will ya? This bike outrides the one it replaces and it ain't going away, so get used to it. Now, let's see how it stacks up overall. Performance, 10 out of 10. Quite simply, this bike is a stunning package of handling and power and braking. Styling, seven out of 10. I like this bike more and more every time I see it. But that said, it's not gonna be any great beauty like its princess. Comfort, seven out of 10. Quite amazingly, the most comfortable super sports Ducati ever. Not the torture rack that the old models were, very well improved. Reliability, we're gonna sit on the fence here and go with a five out of 10 because the bike simply hasn't been out long enough to be proven yet. But the old models were getting better and better. If you do want one of these though, make sure you do spend money on proper servicing. 
Value for money, seven out of 10, but only if you're loaded. 11 and a half grand is a lot of money for a motorcycle. That said, if you can afford it, you get an awesome package. A Harley Davidson is a rolling fashion statement. Now, whether you think they're for perfume ponces with more money than sense, or whether they rock your two-wheeled world to the exclusion of everything else, one thing is for certain, you cannot ignore them. And boy, does Joe Public love their Harleys. Valentino Rossi could wheelie down your local high street naked, facing backwards and singing the Italian national anthem. Chances are nobody would bat an eyelid. However, you turn up on a Harley, you've got their attention in seconds. And there is no Harley Davidson guaranteed to get more attention than this, the brand new V-Rod. It's an image thing, it's a heritage thing, it's a rock and roll thing, but most of all, it's a cool thing. Just one look tells you this ain't no ordinary Harley. The styling's gone all swoopy, bendy, liquid mercury on us. Hell, the thing almost looks futuristic for a change. And then there's the performance. No, really, there is. OK, we'll never see a V-Rod in World Superbikes, and you're going to struggle if you want to do a track day on one, but this big beast fair old shifts when you put the hammer down. It'll even stop hard when asked, and can get round corners with a degree of accuracy and amusement should you wish to get funky with it. Hop aboard the V-Rod, and once you've got over the incredibly low seat height and the vast length of the thing, you're going to find yourself slipping into cruiser mode in no time at all. You know the deal, feet up in the breeze, 4,000 revs on the taco, and feeling like you're Peter Fonda out of Easy Rider. However, this is only half of the story with this Harley, because it revs to 10,000 RPM, very high for a cruiser. Pin that throttle, hang on, and I challenge you not to laugh, because this bike is indecently fast for something so fat. In fact, away from the traffic lights, it charges like a rampaging bull walrus on heat. This is a Harley that could actually land you in hot water with the law. Well, I never. Twin discs and four-pot calipers take care of braking duties at the front, while the forks actually seem to have a degree of control and damping about them, rather than the normal vague deadness we've come to expect from a Harley front end. So you can really use those anchors to their full effect. At the back, you'll find plenty of power on the other end of that huge brake pedal too, so vast, howling, childish skids are very much on the menu, should you fancy it. So it's got the looks, it's got the cred, and by jingo, it's even got the performance to go with it. Could this be the perfect performance poser? Possibly, but it sure ain't perfect. First up, there's that price tag. 14 grand is a lot of money for a motorcycle, no matter how pretty it is. And talking of pretty, that's one thing your V-Rod won't be for long if you're lazy with the polishing rag, because this thing will rot like a supermarket trolley in the local canal if you don't look after it in our climate. Then there's the comfort, which is, to be honest, marginal for the rider at best, as you sit there like a spinnaker in the wind hanging off those bars. And as for pillions, forget it, unless they're small, female, and keen on doing their best baby lemur clinging to its mother's back impression every time they go out. Not only does that pillion seat slope backwards, but it is tiny to go with it. And for a final kick in the pods, V-Rods have been notoriously difficult to get hold of until now. Although Harley say they're bringing a lot more in this year, so maybe that problem's gonna go away. But what the heck? The V-Rod is simply stunning to look at, and it is a technological marvel for Harley. Also, it performs in a way that bikes like this really shouldn't. So if you're after something a bit different, you've got loads of cash to splash and you want to turn heads, this could really be a smart place to go. However, just don't forget the polishing rags. There's a good chap. And now it's time for the scores. Performance, eight out of 10. Absolutely stacks of it for a cruiser. Style, 10 out of 10. She's a beauty. Comfort, six out of 10. Bearable, but not beautiful. Reliability, six out of 10 you are going to have to look after this thing if it isn't going to rock before your eyes. Value for money. 10 out of 10 if you like the looks, 0 out of 10 if you don't. Whatever way you look at it, it is an expensive motorcycle. And so with the buying information out of the way, where better to spend your sports touring wedge than on a Honda VFR? This bike is quite simply a living legend and has trounced all comers in the sports tourers class in its various guises over the years and quite rightly so. It is pure Honda, impeccably well thought out, so refined it hurts, and frankly, this bike is capable of turning its hand to just about anything this side of a motocross Grand Prix. And every time I ride a VFR, I have the same problem, because I have fun and I don't want to. You know, I'm still young, 
and a Veerfart is a sensible bike, an old man's bike, a bike for people with less imagination than the average traffic cone. But try as you might to convince yourself the VFR's really not your thing. Ride one and I challenge you not to be won over in nanoseconds. Take the VFR riding position for example. It is a perfect blend of the sporty and the comfortable. Here is a bike you could just as easily spend all day on, be it tooling across town or hacking down motorways, as you could blasting down the best alpine passes you could possibly find without breaking into a sweat. And backing up this riding position that lets you do it all, there's a motor that's going to let you do it all as well. Still only just tipping the 100 brake horsepower mark at the back wheel, the VFR's motor is as refined as the rest of the bike. There's a healthy dose of character thanks to the V4 lump behind those fairing panels, and there's a lovely, easy-going, torquey drive right off the bottom of the taco, which means easy speed is at your disposal whenever you fancy it. In a nutshell, Honda's VTEC is variable valve timing, and what it means in theory is that below 7,000 RPM, the motor's running on two valves per cylinder. This doesn't quite give you optimum performance, but it does give you better torque. However, cross that 7,000 RPM watershed, we're onto four valves per cylinder for maximum performance. That's the theory. What you've got in practice is below 7,000, you've got normal VFR shove, just like the old bike. But across that watershed and whoosh, the whole thing picks up its skirts and heads off into the horizon, with a lovely burble coming out the exhaust as well. It could even be called a little bit exciting. The chassis saw a host of updates when this model came in last year too, with a stiffer and revised steering head, frame spars and frame brackets, which all mean better control and more responsiveness when you're tramping off. Link brakes still come as standard on the VFR, which means a little bit of back brake gives you a bit of front brake and vice versa. But to be honest, in practice, you're unlikely to notice them at all. What you will notice is plenty of stopping power everywhere. Although, if you want 10 tenths braking, you're still going to have to take a fair old tug on that lever. So there we have it, the Honda VFR. Still a legend after all these years and still the best sports tourer that money can buy. Now it's time for the scores. Performance. 9 out of 10. Excels at nothing, but is great at everything. Style, 7 out of 10. Never going to be stunning anyone, but it's kind of pleasingly smooth and chunky enough to get away with. Comfort, 9 out of 10. Yes, you could spend all day, all night, all of the next day, and probably an entire month of all one of these without coming to any food. Reliability, 10 out of 10. If the dinosaurs had motorbikes, they were probably VFRs, and if you buy one of these, chances are you'll be able to run it for 100,000 miles before you finally decide you've had enough of the colour and you chop it in for another one. Value for money, 8 out of 10. You pay a premium to buy one, be it new or secondhand, but they hold their money well and they will probably last forever. There are a number of things that BMW motorcycles are renowned for, and these include having very complicated switch gear until you get used to it, rocking alarmingly to one side at a standstill thanks to the shaft drive spinning, and also being really rather dull. Much like the Germans themselves, BMW motorcycles are often perceived as being very efficient, very practical, but really lacking in any great spark of life or originality. And while BMW refuse to bow to convention and continue to make motorcycles that are uniquely their own, they are working their freshly pressed German socks off to try and make some motorcycles that will actually attract people because they've got some life to them. And this is where we come to the Rockster here. What it actually is, is an R1150R, dressed up a bit and with a snazzier name. But as we'll see, that's not actually a bad thing at all. You see, the R1150R is one of motorcycling's great secrets because as far as pure and basic riding experiences go, it is an absolute belter. It's not the fastest bike around and nor is it the sharpest either. But for plain old-fashioned riding about, as long as you don't feel any real need to top 100 mile an hour, it is about as good as it gets. And riding one, you soon start to feel smugly pleased with yourself that you've discovered this two-wheeled utopia, while everyone else around you continues in blissful ignorance. The 1150cc opposed twin boxer motor inside the Rockster is also an absolute joy to play with. Now granted, it may not be the outright fastest motor around, but this is one seriously hefty piece of metalwork here that produces stacks of low-down torque, and especially with the optional extra race can and chip as fitted to this bike, there is more than enough stomp on tap off the bottom end of the dial to see off plenty of sports bikes from the lats should you catch them napping. 
Once you've prodded through the gearbox, top speed is realistically around about the 100 mile an hour mark, comes up very quickly. You can go on to about 120 should you feel like it, but without a fairing, it's really not very funny. As with all of BMW's big bikes, the Rockster does run their telelever front suspension system, which isolates the braking and suspension forces. The strange bit about this is you don't really get any fork dive on the brakes, but the plus side is a very planted front end that soaks up anything you can throw at it within the constraints of the motor's abilities. Also, on the Rockster, as opposed to the R1150R, you now get the front end off their sportier R1150S. So the question has to be, are BMW onto a winner with the Rockster? And I would say the answer to that question is yes. Because although this motorcycle will never be quite as mad as something like a Prilius Tuono or Triumph Speed Triple, what BMW have here is a very nicely tweaked version of an already excellent motorcycle that has got plenty of attitude. Now, if you're spending just over seven grand on a bike, you're gonna have a lot to choose from. But if you want an everyday machine that's still got plenty of bite and will last forever, then the Rockster could be very well worth having a look at. So let's see how it stacks up in the final scores. Styling, eight out of 10. This bike is seriously cool. Performance, seven out of 10. Maybe bumping up to an eight once you add on the race can and extra chip for a bit more oomph. Comfort, seven out of 10. Very good everyday riding about, but the only gripe I've got is those bars which do go a little too far forwards and could be a bit tricky should you want to go for a bit of distance. Reliability, 9 out of 10. It's a BMW, it will go on forever. Value for money, 7 out of 10. Not the cheapest bike around, but like I said, it will last a very long time and I'm pretty certain you're going to enjoy it. And now we come to our first sports tour of the day with this, the Kawasaki ZZR 1200. Now, if this bike looks strangely familiar to some of you, don't be worried about it. It's because this is an adapted, breathed upon and tweaked version of Kawasaki's ZZR 1100, the legendary top speed king that ruled the high speed charts for all of six years until Honda's Blackbird came along to snatch the crown. Now then, the ZZR 11 was a very fast motorcycle, something that struck fear, awe and trepidation into the hearts of all who came across it, and anybody who had bikes in their life and a pulse in their body wanted to go on one. It has to be said, the ZZR 1200 will never inherit the 1100's mantle. Where the 1100's bulbous ugliness was perfectly acceptable in the light of its relative performance merits, the ZZR 1200 is, by and large, simply unattractive and overweight. Time, fashion and superfast motorcycles have moved on, and the ZZR12 just ain't in the in crowd anymore. But then that's not what Kawasaki wanted it to do. After all, they're already packing the best hyperbike on the market in their lineup with the latest incarnation of the ZX12, so launching another model to compete against it could hardly be a smart move. Nope, the ZZR 1200's remit is a very different one. Instead of heading out there to be a cutting edge hyperblaster, the ZZR 1200 is a far more all rounded, balanced, real world alternative that just happens to have as an added bonus one serious rush of speed if that happens to be your drug of choice. Coming to the practicalities of the thing, let's start with the comfort because this seat is palatial. It will even make the VFR's perch feel positively anorexic by comparison. Your pillion perch really isn't far off being as good as the rider's side either. And as well as that, there's this huge fairing up here which cocoons you from head to toe in a lovely bubble of peaceful still air. Best of all though, there's the motor. Against the higher booster or a ZX12, it may feel a bit slow. And true, being carbureted, it does spin up with a little less urgency than more modern sporting beasts. But get on the gas and you will be left in no doubt that this is still one brutally fast piece of machinery. Chassis and suspension have been worked over too from the original ZZR, with geometry tweaks throughout to speed up the steering and an all over helping of extra chassis stiffness. The ZZR 1200 suspension works very well within the limits of the bike, i.e. good fast cruising, open roads, you can even do some scratching, get a bit energetic in the tight stuff if that's what you want to do. However, push on too hard, get into real sports bike mode, and the budget nature of this suspension will start to show itself up, as the whole plot becomes a little unglued, bounces around, you don't get so much feedback to get on in confidence. But really, if you want to ride that hard, may I suggest you look elsewhere for your jollies. Otherwise, ZZR 1200 holds its own very well indeed. Obviously, it's not all perfect. Like I said earlier, it is an ugly motorcycle, and despite all the tweaks and fiddles, it will take more than a redesigned fairing and a big bore to convince anyone that this is much more than a dusted off and dressed up ZZR 1100. 
And with its makeup so firmly rooted in the past, there's no surprises to find a host of old school touches on the ZZR 1200. For example, there are those great big analog clocks, there are mirrors the size of dinner plates, and for anyone who's been riding fuel injected bikes recently, best get used to the fact there's a fuel tap on this one and it's running carbs. Therefore, soon as you run out, you better get quick on the draw with getting to that tap before you stutter to a halt. So, fashion and the complexities of a modern age have largely passed the big Z by, but this is no bad thing because beneath all that, this is a very good, very fast, comfortable mile muncher that is actually quite hard to beat. So, how does it stack up in the scores? Performance, 8 out of 10. You've got a lot of bang for your buck with this one. Style, 5 out of 10. She's no beauty queen, and that's for sure. Comfort, 9 out of 10. You really could cross continents in a day, no worries on one of these two up or so long. Reliability, 6 out of 10. Given that it comes from the ZZR 1100, the basis of this bike is actually quite old. And if it's anything like the 1100 was, then things like chains, tyres, cush drives and head bearings are all in for a rough ride. Value for money, 8 out of 10. If fashion isn't your thing, but big miles are, and you still want some fun to be had while you're at it, then this really could be money well spent. KTM's LC4 has been with us now since 1997. And even though it's based on the factory's competition bikes, they have made some gentle concessions towards making it more road biased than track biased. Now this is a serious motorcycle in a very silly way. Confused? Then let me explain. It's serious because it comes from a long line of barking black and orange off-roaders from KTM and these have dominated off-road competition for years now. This means that in all of them, with the possible exception of the Duke, you get that barely distilled competition feel. So you can forget comfort for starters. There's a seat to sit on, but I challenge you to get much further than the end of the road before numb bum syndrome rears its ugly head. You can forget other handy essentials too, like a petrol tank that's going to take you much more than 70 miles before reserve, or a pillion seat that's going to keep the girlfriend happy for too long. But one ride on this bike is all it takes for everything to make sense, because this is where the silly part of the equation comes into play. The competition-derived chassis and superb suspension mean devouring town potholes and back road bumps, or perhaps even the odd field, are exactly what this bike was made for while the excellent brakes mean you can normally get yourself out of any trouble, which you're invariably going to get yourself into. And that 640cc single in there even has a touch of smoothness to it for a big thumper. And it is an absolute cracker as well, with plenty of grunt to play with. Oh, and this motorcycle wheelies for England as well, seeming to balance perfectly happily on one wheel for about as long as you fancy keeping it up, if that's your thing. If it's not, then may I suggest that perhaps this bike isn't for you. If it is, and you know who you are, then you will love absolutely every minute of it. Styling, a very well deserved 8 out of 10. Performance, it's another 8 out of 10. Practicality, 6 out of 10. This is still a supermoto after all. Value. 7 out of 10. It's not all that cheap either. So you've ridden loads of motorbikes and now you decide you really want something very, very different. But where to begin? Well, after lots of soul searching and head scratching, you might decide that perhaps a BMW could be the answer. So you take a trip to your local BMW dealership and you come across one of these, an R1200C. How much more different would you like to get? There is not another bike on the planet that looks like this, but is it any good? Well, before you ride it anywhere, you're going to notice that it is very well equipped. After all, this is a BMW, which means a host of lovely little touches. These extend all the way from what is perhaps the best toolkit on any motorcycle to be found under the seat, the decent pillion perch with a nice well, all the way through to the heated grips, which are an absolute godsend in this climate. Admittedly, this bike is a cruiser, so it's never supposed to be the fastest thing on the planet, but it is surprising that given that that motor is the biggest incarnation of the Boxer Twin that BMW do at 1200cc, 
that it can have so little character and also be so slow. It'll get you up to 70 odd mile an hour easily enough, but there's no real character to the experience of getting there. As for the rest of it, the fueling really isn't all that smart, snatching on and off the throttle and making cruising around, even at slow speeds, a bit of a pain. And the gearbox, although it is positive enough, does require a firm boot. Another area on the R1200C that's less than perfect are the brakes. They may have snazzy Brembo logos on them, but to be honest, adequate is the best they can be described as. As you can guess by now, I'm really not the biggest fan of this bike. I admire what BMW have tried to do with being so different, but to be honest, I don't reckon they got it right this time. This is simply not a very nice motorcycle to spend time with. It's not comfortable enough, no matter how well built it actually is. Anyway, how does it rack up in the scores? Styling, 8 out of 10. Got to be the bike's strong point. Love it or loathe it, you cannot ignore it. Performance, 5 out of 10. The handling is way up for a cruiser, but sadly that motor and those brakes are nothing better than average. Comfort, 3 out of 10. Oh dear. For a cruiser packing away some long straight miles, this really isn't a comfortable motorcycle. Sorry. Street cred, 5 out of 10. Again, it comes down to that styling. People will love it or hate it, but it's never going to be as cool as a Harley. Reliability, 9 out of 10. It's a BMW, it will go on forever and ever and ever. Value for money, 6 out of 10. I reckon you would really have to want one of these to actually part with hard cash to get one. Regardless of how you feel about any of this bike's other quirks or deficiencies, by far and away the worst part of the R1200C riding experience is the riding position. Granted, sat like I am now, it's really quite comfortable. This seat is very, very soft, even supports your back a little bit. And the pegs are in just the right place too. But the problem comes when you decide you want to go anywhere and you have to reach them bars because they're absolutely miles away. Go any more than five miles and you're gonna start feeling it across the tops of your shoulders. And if you fancy topping 60 mile an hour, you're probably gonna have to work out. So here we are cruising in the local park, but don't worry, there's nothing untoward going on here. We are in fact just doing part one of our three-part cruisers test with this, the Kawasaki Mean Streak. Now for years, Kawasaki have been very adept at making the most out of all the individual bikes in their lineup. And this one is no exception because it is a breathed on and slightly tarted up VN 1500 underneath all this. Now the idea behind the Mean Streak is to get onto the bandwagon of performance cruising as kicked well and truly back into life by Harley's V-Rod. But I've got to say, I'm not sure this bike's quite up to the task. One thing that has been slightly overlooked in the Mean Street styling exercise, however, is the pillion seat. Look at it, there's absolutely nothing there, and I personally wouldn't want to sit on that for any more than about two minutes. But outright performance isn't everything, and the fact that the Mean Streak is actually basically a VN 1500 underneath all its dressy clothes is no bad thing, because the VN is a very capable motorcycle indeed. The gearbox is nice and light, so is the throttle. The brakes, which have actually been beefed up on this, now give you plenty of stopping power, actually a little too much for those forks on occasion, so you might want to be a bit gentle with them. The fuel injection is very gentle and smooth, and all in all, it's a relatively easy bike to potter about on. The only difference being that in its new Mean Street guys, this VN-based machine does get a little heavy at low speed. So, wandering around in the car park or whatever, just make sure you keep your feet handy because you might need to dab them. Inside the motor, they have hotted things up ever so slightly to give us about an extra seven horsepower, but this isn't exactly the largest increase ever seen in the world, and I wouldn't exactly term it performance. Overall, none of the upgrades, good though they may look, actually conceal the fact this is still just a rather sluggardly but large custom bike beneath all the baubles. Obviously, grinding away vast pieces of the side of your motorcycle is often an enjoyable experience, but it's a very, very costly way to get your kicks. So, with the Mean Street, leave the hard corner into a different bike, chill the pace out and enjoy the admiring glances as everyone looks at the vast, shiny size of your motorcycle. When it comes to faster corners, the Mean Street can be piloted around with a fair degree of accuracy for the kind of bike it is, and also the ground clearance really isn't too bad. However, don't ever try and get energetic with it because you'll soon find the limits pretty quickly. After all, the Mean Streak is still packing 1,500 cc's of motor down there. That is more than the average small family car, so why, oh why, does it have to be so strangled in its power output? 
What I would love to see would be for someone to take one of these engines and really go to town on them. After all, it's so understressed in there. You could easily see another 30 odd horsepower out of that without damaging things too much, I would reckon. Now we'd be looking at about 100 horse, more like V-Rod performance and something like that could be very interesting indeed. But what do I know? It's time for the scores now. Performance, six out of 10. There ain't really any performance here to speak of. What you get is a cruiser. Style, seven out of 10. It's got plenty of low chrome cruiser presence to keep passers-by happy and staring at you. But it's gotta lose a few points for those disgusting neon stickers on the tank. Comfort, six out of 10. Nice squashy seat, plenty of room for your legs, but you really are hung out to dry on those narrow bars. So if you wanna get some speed in, it's gonna hurt your shoulders. Reliability. 9 out of 10, that motor is so understressed and it's shaft drive, this bike will last forever. Whether that's a good thing or not depends on your point of view. Value for money, 8 out of 10. If you want a cruiser and you can't afford the big bucks for a Harley, then this is a lot of motorcycle for the money. Just don't expect any performance to go with it. It's a funny thing about muscle bikes. On the one hand, they're a little bit like customs. The looks are absolutely all important got to get that right. But on the other hand, they should have a bit more go in them than your average custom bike. So what about this one? The XJR 1300 SP. Well, looking down it, there's no doubts it's got the styling. Look at the size of that motor down there. Your neighbour is going to be very impressed by this, especially when you tell him it's 1300 cc's, which is probably bigger than his car that he's using to run about in. Check on down there, there's also the fins that make it look like it's got the genuine, authentic, old school air cooling. Actually, this is a proper modern motor with a liquid cooling in it. Hop on board the XJR and the first thing you're going to notice is that despite the fact that this is one solid, serious, hefty lump of motorcycle, it really doesn't feel that bad once you've got it moving. As long as you can get your feet down to the floor, you'll be able to ride one of these, no worries. Now in the case of this version here, this is the SP version. It's a few hundred quid more, and the only real difference you get for that is the Olin shocks down the back here. They do actually help the handling, but we'll come to that later. The only other difference with the SP over the standard XJR is the paintwork. Now, sadly, this one is a little bit on the subdued side. Normally, there's another version in a beautiful blue and white. As with all good retro muscle bikes, the heart of the XJR is not a brand new engine. In fact, this motor goes way back into the early 80s when it used to be the power plant for the FJ1200. Now at the time, that was a cutting edge sports bike. People said it was so powerful, but to be honest, if you rode one now, it would feel a little bit flat as far as sportiness goes. However, this motor has a new lease of life. One thing the FJ motor was always very good at was being smooth, talky, and creamy. Loads of mid-range, not loads of top end, but up to about 100 mile an hour, you've got stacks of shove and go, and that's exactly what you need in a big naked muscle bike like this. But all is not entirely perfect with the XJR. There are a couple of faults we can find. The fuel gauge, very useful to have it, but it gets to about halfway down, which takes quite a long time, then suddenly plummets right the way through the second half of the tank. Either it's a very funny shaped fuel tank or not a perfectly designed gauge. Best thing about the XJR, not only does it have the looks, the styling, the comfort, all those things a muscle bike should have, it also is the way it hangs together beautifully as much more than the sum of its parts. In case you hadn't guessed, I do really rather like this motorcycle, but now it is time for the scores. Performance, eight out of 10. This may not be the most amazing performing motorcycle ever, but in terms of what muscle bikes should do and what this one does do, it really is excellent. Comfort, eight out of 10. Plenty of room, no cramping for your arms or your legs, everything's where it should be. Value for money, seven out of 10. You've got a big lump of good looking motorcycle for just over six grand. Street cred, seven out of 10 in the case of this model with that rather subdued paint job, but if you get the slightly tricker painted options, definitely an eight out of 10. Reliability, seven out of 10. This is a well-made motorcycle. That motor is next to unburstable, as is the gearbox. The brakes are well proven. The only thing you're gonna have to do is spend a bit of time with the toothbrush and the sole bowl, keeping the thing nice and clean.
Power Surge is strong and healthy, and a little more raw than Italy's other twin, the Ducati 998. But it's still a case of using fewer gear changes on the Mille 8 than you would on a big four, and letting that mid-range pull you along for the fast lap times, rather than screaming it up near the red line all the time. And thanks to being such a good handling bike, the Mille can make the most of all the power it has to offer. What this means is that nine times out of 10 on a track day, you'll go faster on one of these for less effort than on pretty much anything else out there. It's a damned fine package, and make no mistake about it. And with all this talk of the Mille's track prowess, it's easy to forget that she can cut it on the road as well. So let's get out and find out about it. The big thump in V-twin power means fast, easy and unflustered progress is yours for the asking, as are wheelies over every crest and hump in the road, if that's your thing. The Mille's riding position is committed, but it's far less torture rack than the most obvious competition this bike has in the Ducati 998. There's also a pillion seat conversion kit that comes as standard should you want to impress giggling impressionable young things, which is something this bike really is quite good at. However, single seated is the way a Mille R should be. And if you do buy one, please take it out to the track and stretch its legs. It will reward you for it. This is a very brilliant motorbike, and that is a fact, plain and simple. From the moment you first hop aboard a Tuono, something just clicks and you know you're in for a special experience. Physically, it is a big bike, and shorter riders may be put off by its tall stance and wide seat. But if it fits you, the Tuono fits like a glove. It is a terrible road testing cliche to say that the controls fall readily to hand. Of course they do. That's what they're there for. But the bar, seat, peg setup on the Tuono is so natural and so perfect for riding, you'd think it had been tailor-made. The chassis is straight off last year's standard Mille, so although you don't get the trick Olin suspension of the old R model, that thoroughbred handling is still there. So you've got road bike relaxation wrapped up in a very taut, very sharp, and very responsive chassis. Sounds good so far. And it only gets better when you get to the motor. So often with bikes like this, the roadster version of the sports model is palmed off with a watered down incarnation of the sports engine, leaving you feeling slightly cheated. But not in this case. There's a full fat 118 genuine horsepower inside that 60 degree V-twin. And they make their presence felt the minute you pull away and the clocks rise up to greet you. This is perhaps the only bike this side of a MotoGP missile where you could legitimately claim that wheelies were the bike's fault and not yours, and have a chance of getting away with it in a court of law. The way this thing drives, punches and annihilates back roads has to be experienced to be believed. And the way the chassis, brakes and riding position allow you to make the most of everything the Tuono has to offer only makes it even more of a joy. I'd say we may have a winner here. Styling, seven out of 10. It's okay, but it's not gonna be everyone's cup of tea. Performance, nine out of 10. Plain old brilliant. Practicality, eight out of 10. As long as you get on with V-twins, this bike is easy to live with. Value, eight out of 10. It's not the cheapest bike around, but it's not too expensive either. So, here we have BMW's K1200LT, the biggest tourer they have in the range. And it's actually a surprise to find that despite BMW's reputation for building very long-lasting, very efficient motorcycles, this is not actually the perfect tourer. But before we get to the niggles that actually make this bike less than perfect, let's talk about what's good about it. There are heated seats and backrests if you want them, there's cruise control, there's a four-speaker stereo system and optional CD auto changer, there's a reverse gear as well. You'd sprout a hernia instantly trying to back one of these out on an uphill parking space without it. And best of all, on the options list, should you really want it, you'll even find a fridge. And beneath all these trinkets and baubles is a massive aluminium spine frame holding the whole lot together and more built-in panniers and cubby holes than you can shake a stick at. When it comes to handling, the K1200 is very agile indeed, despite an all-up weight akin to a pair of fire blades. At low speed, she is a bit cumbersome, but get her moving, and despite being no sports bike, very obviously, she 
actually is the best handling of any bike this size and also has very good ground clearance to boot. Being a BMW, you would expect reliability on the K12 to be absolutely bang on. But I have to say, from a previous experience with one of these bikes, I'm not sure that could always be the case. It happened a couple of years ago when we took one all the way across France. And on this trip, right near the beginning, the gearbox linkage sheared very shortly after we got past Calais, leaving the bike stuck in one gear for the rest of the trip. And I can tell you that bump starting one of these on a daily basis soon becomes a royal pain in the behind. Fair enough, that test bike may not have been a typical example, but it was fully prepared and brand new. And as far as I'm concerned, 14 and a half grand motorbikes should not go wrong like that. But enough of this already, let's go to the final scoreboards and see how this baby stacks up. Performance, seven out of 10. To be honest, the motor's a bit on the weedy side for a bike this big, but that score gets bumped up again thanks to the fact the handling's so good on the move. Styling, five out of 10. Call me old fashioned, but I reckon it's bland as hell. It's very smooth, it's very sleek, but to be honest, this thing leaves no impression on me at all. Comfort, eight out of 10. Really very good, but the gold wings better. Reliability, seven out of 10. Pretty good, but past experience tells me that perhaps the electrics aren't quite up to the job. Value, six out of 10. This is, let us not forget, a 14 and a half thousand pound motorcycle once you've thrown in a few extras. And that for me is a lot of money for a bike that has as many little glitches as this one does. On the face of it, Kawasaki ZR7 makes perfect sense. After all, it's friendly, it's easy to get on with, and hell, it's even a 750. However, beneath this cheery little facade lies one of the most pointless and dull objects in motorcycling today. If this bike were a colour, it would be beige. Am I being a bit harsh here though? After all, the ZR7, it's got two wheels, it's got an engine, 750 cc's at that, it's just over four grand brand new, there's a fairing, you could do distance on it, you could slap a pillion if you wanted to, and you're not gonna be too uncomfortable either. But sadly, I'm not being a bit harsh. You see, in this day and age, simply being a cheap and functioning motorcycle isn't really enough to actually cut the mustard. What's needed, every bike, it should have some fun, it should have some excitement, some sparkle, and sadly, the ZR7 is absolutely devoid of any redeeming features like that whatsoever. Should you actually stay awake on a ZR7 long enough to ride at any distance, you will find a motor that, despite being a 750, is both flat, slow, lethargic, listless, and dull all at once. On top of this, the carbs are also, well, they're fairly old school, and the response off the throttle is not exactly what we call crisp. All in all, it does go forward when you turn the loud handle, and it does slow down when you shut it. But beyond that, it doesn't really do a lot else. And so what are the handling? Well, the ZR7 does go around corners okay. It goes in one side, it comes out the other, and when you push the bars, it goes the way you want it to. But there's absolutely no eagerness to it at all. The bike just feels kind of resigned to it, like an old dog being told what to do. And the suspensions, it's the same old story. It does tell you a little bit about what's going on between the tarmac and the tyres, but not really a great deal. It's as if it hasn't quite woken up and can't quite be bothered to get on with doing the job it's supposed to do. Effective, but no more. And should there come a time, as there probably will quite soon, when you want to stop your ZR7 and get off it, you'll be pleased to find the brakes do at least work. You pull the lever, everything slows down, back brake does the back wheel, front brake does the front wheel, and at least you can stop, get off, and put an end to the whole terrible experience. All told, there have to be over a hundred better ways to spend just over £4,000 than by buying yourself a new ZR7. Let's face it, if it's fun and exciting you want for your money, what about an Aprilia RS250? Absolutely manic. If it's sensible, something that'll do town work, what about Yamaha's venerable XTZ660 single cylinder trailer? And if it's just a pure, unburstable beginner's bike with a bit of fun and zip to it that you want, what about a Honda CB500? But what can I do? I'm stuck with this and it's time to go home. Actually, having thought about it, I think I'll get the bus. Anyway, I shall leave you with the scores. Performance, four out of 10. 
really only picking up a few marks here for managing to go, stop and turn. Styling, four out of 10. Bland is being kind, but at least that little fairing does help a bit. Reliability, nine out of 10. Sadly, this bike will probably go on forever. Value for money, four out of 10. There are many better options for spending your money on if you want a basic motorcycle than this one. Street cred, not out of 10, not a hope.